Hello, friends, and welcome to this week's Politics in the Pulpit, um, a JPIT initiative, a lectionary preaching resource where we explore how uh, politics and our preaching may come together this week. And uh, on this edition of Politics in the Pulpit, I am uh, pleased to have with me uh, Alex Clare Young, who is a URC minister and is also currently uh, doing some research on the experiences and theological insights of trans and non-binary Christians. Alex, welcome. Hi. It's great to have you as part of Politics in the Pulpit. It's good to be here. Um, so, Alex, politics preaching is that an easy combination for you uh how do you come at it i think in terms of small p politics we kind of can't ignore it at all um in preaching that the whole context of the gospel for in my opinion is social justice lived out and you can't talk about social justice without getting political um so it's really important to me it's not always easy. I definitely preach in some churches where they'd rather I'd left my politics at the door, um, but that's just not something I can do. Okay, so it's pretty integral then to, yeah. to the stuff that you're doing. Okay. Absolutely. Um, so I wonder then from the the work that, that you're doing from your ministry, what what are some of the um, the significant political and social issues around at the moment? What are some of the things that loom large in your mind as you prepare to preach? Um, I think at the moment, obviously, the kind of worsening division in society um, that it's got to such, such an extent that people are dying um, because people disagree with each other um, and that we don't seem to be able to have sensible conversations about things that we disagree about. Um, it ends up spiraling into debate or worse um, with some people just completely denying the humanity of others, which I think is really difficult. Um, and then obviously we also have COP26 coming up. I'm a member of the Iona community and one of our key concerns is kind of environmental um, concerns and activism around that. So a lot of us are getting very busy preparing for COP26 um, and kind of having a witness there. Mm. Great. And that those two things tie in very much with uh, my notes this week from our marvellous JPIT uh, team who always send me a little bit of a rundown of things that we uh, sort of setting our political context and obviously the thing that looms largest for many of us at the moment is uh, the killing of David Amos uh, last week I, I'm in South End David was an RMP where the other half of the town but it's had a, a deep and profound effect on many people um, across the county uh, of Essex where David had represented uh, in, in, who David had represented in Parliament for over 40 years and then um, COP26 uh, obviously is, is coming. It's getting closer and closer. And it's, uh, it's rather inspired to see a lot of pictures via uh, Twitter and whatever uh, over the weekend of churches unveiling banners. Um, and there's been some really interesting, creative, uh, artistic engagement in preparing for COP. I'm afraid the, the memo about that rather passed me by. So we haven't unfurled a banner, but I've enjoyed looking at everybody else's. Um, that over the weekend and, and Monday of this week, we had the multi-faith days of action for COP as well. Um, and that um, a multi-faith letter will be handed to number 10 on Wednesday of this week. There will also be this week a rally in Parliament Square um, concerning the Nationality and Borders Bill, which I know has been a part of conversations for a lot of people over recent weeks and months. And then on the news today, we saw um, about uh, a new set of floods in India and the destruction that that's brought with it, which is, I suspect, not unrelated to COP26 conversations. Um, so it, it's very difficult. I, it's one of these days where it feels like it'd be very easy to be a little bit despairing. Um, and uh, it's it's not, not easy. Um, in terms of, of what's happened in South End in, in recent days, you mentioned about the the importance of public discourse. And it's, of course, one of the yeah. JPIT hopes, one of our six hopes is to help create a kind of politics uh, yeah. in the world. That's quite a challenge. I don't know. Are you do you, do you see any of this on Twitter? Are you, are you a big social media user and do you come across any of the um, the not so good stuff? 
Um, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I don't use Twitter very much, but I do have a Twitter account. And um, as a transgender person, I'm also often the subject of tweeting storms, um, usually sadly started by Christian groups or charities um, that are kind of designed to, desi to divide people and to say there's only one way to be Christian, there's only one way to, to live in the UK, um, which causes all sorts of difficulties. And it's one of the reasons that I'm not very active on Twitter, um, is that I'm not convinced that debate in that kind of way is the way forward for us. I think actually we need to be able to have bigger conversations where we're listening to each other, not just um, hearing to respond, as it were, which I think sometimes on Twitter, you're thinking, well, what am I going to retweet? Um, what am I going to reply? Rather than actually really hearing each other. And I think that can be really difficult. That's really interesting. We, um, I was reflecting with a friend over the weekend about conversations in our own denomination uh, about variety of different things and just how the need to be more efficient and more frugal and all these things that might be good that are going to save everybody time and money have actually had a cost in terms of the quality of, of conversation um, and that we don't give enough time to the building of relationships is my contention yeah. and therefore when we come across something difficult um, we don't have th that bedrock of, of humanity uh, and relationship to draw on which you know i think that helps uh, it makes it harder absolutely and i find that people um will make comments anti a certain group of people and then when they actually meet someone they'll say well yes but i didn't mean you and it's because actually when we're face to face with each other i think our similarities are more obvious than our differences um but when we're talking about each other as abstract labels then the differences get really heightened, um, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I think that's that's bang on. Um, so let's turn to our, our lectionary text for this week and see if we can make any natural links between what we've been talking about and that, or, or maybe not. Uh, maybe links between the passages or maybe not uh, as well. Um, I don't know how often you preach from, from the lectionary. Um, do you, do you usually have a go-to starting place? Like for me, I tend to start with a gospel reading and work backwards. Um, but uh, how do you approach it usually? Yeah, I think I also tend to start with the gospel reading unless there's any kind of big themes um, which seem to shine through. Although sometimes what I think is a big theme isn't always something that other people um, <laughs> say is a big theme. But so, for example, in this week's text, I really think there is this theme of of grace um, and of not having to adhere to particular norms running through. But I wonder how much of that is in the text and how much of that comes from my context as well. Yeah, really interesting. And uh, I mean, that's the beauty of, for me of these conversations is I, I, I'll i bring certain things from my context, you'll be here and I, I will, there'll be things that I haven't seen at all. And it's such a joy to be shown them and have my eyes open to them. So uh, I appreciate you being here to, to help with that um so where do we want to start this week should we start with the gospel reading and work out from there we haven't done that yeah. on the podcast for a little while we've usually gone in sequence so Alex, let's make a start then with our gospel reading since we both confess to being people who like to do that anyway um, prepping for this morning I, I didn't i don't think i'd noted before how this is the last healing in mark's gospel and also how it's bartimaeus who gives us uh the title Jesus son of David I've not quite got how pivotal this this little section of, of the gospel is uh, before uh, what for you is the the good news of this uh, passage what's the challenge to us mm. I think the challenge is to not focus too much on the healing and actually look at what happened before because I think sometimes when we talk about healing we ignore or devalue the insights of disabled people um, when we're talking about these texts and actually this this text just kind of has the healing of the last verse and there's yeah. all of this stuff before that um where everyone's telling this this guy to be quiet and to kind of fit in and stay on the sidelines and actually jesus stops and calls him to come just as he is and i think that's kind of amazingly countercultural that what everyone else is telling the guy to do jesus says the opposite i think that's really interesting 
Yeah, I, I think the role of the crowd here is really interesting and, and has quite a lot in common with other encounters that Jesus has with people in Mark's gospel, where the crowd are in the way mm. or the crowd um, are actively speaking or, or actively hindering uh, the person um, as well. Um, and and here, the I, I found there's something, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I, it struck me there was something wonderfully encouraging here for people um, who are used to being told to sit down and shut up, actually, yeah. because Bartimaeus, it says, where is it? Um, he just gets louder and he cries out louder. And I'm like, and, and, and Jesus responds to him and the crowd, the crowd have got it wrong again. And that yeah. there's got to be something in there about the crowd getting it wrong and the voice crying out loudly um, for, for Jesus and for justice. Absolutely. And I kind of felt like that carries on in Jesus's comment that your faith has healed you. I mean, okay. we hear that as being faith in Jesus, and I'm sure that that is what it means to some extent. But also there's an element of faith in that refusal to shut up, that actually it takes faith and courage to keep going, to keep asking for help, to keep saying, look, this is who I am. And actually, I want to be engaged in this conversation, too. Um, regardless of everyone telling you to be quiet. Um, it's not easy to be the kind of sore thumb saying, actually, this needs to be heard. Um, so I think that takes Bartimaeus quite a lot of faith um, and that it gives me hope that his faith, his refusal to shut up is actually rewarded, not condemned. Yeah, and he, and he very much goes all in as well, doesn't he? I mean, Bartimaeus, I mean, he reads... Um... Where is the verse? Yeah, so in verse, I think it's 50, it says, throwing his cloak aside, um, he got up and came to Jesus. And then a couple of verses later, he followed Jesus along the road. So it's a very quick transition. But also, I was struck by this throwing the cloak aside. I mean, that I, you know, would have been where he would have collected his arms and his cloak and would have been the thing that kept him warm. And yet the, this encounter with Jesus is enough for him to just throw that to one side and there's a real sense of something new emerging here, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And a sense of letting go of everything that's put on him, letting go of the need to protect himself um, in this unfriendly world, which also makes me think about accessibility and the fact that actually perhaps healing for him is about being included in a world that doesn't include him. I mean, maybe he is physically healed, but actually the focus of being able to go um as he is without the need for um extra armor as it were is quite powerful yeah and and he doesn't wait for the invitation to take part either he cries out he cries out louder he gets up he goes to jesus he he's prepared to take a bit of initiative here as well absolutely and he's not scared of what other people will think mm. oh, that's a, a challenge uh, in these days as much as any days that have gone before i think mm. um prepping for this morning a lot of the reading that i was doing contrasted this encounter very much with the uh the rich man that we've met earlier in uh, mark 10 and his sort of lack of willingness to go all in in the way that yeah. bartimaeus does and um I, I read and i wrote it down because it's not language i would naturally you know be clever enough to use but it says uh, the poor here, I guess, including Bartimaeus, who would have been poor by virtue of his disability, uh, join in the final assault on the dominant ideological order. And that there is a significance here that just before Jesus comes to Jerusalem, you have the poor who are all in, where want to be part of this. And it's those with power, wealth, that really aren't sure whether they can do this. And so as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, the poor people he's met on the road are following on the way. And it's the others who aren't sure whether they can do that yet. Absolutely. And the sense that the rich young man kind of had done everything right, but actually that wasn't enough. And in theory, this blind guy's done everything wrong, right? Like he won't shut up. He won't be quiet. He can't be. He can't make a living for himself. Um, but he's the one who actually gets invited who's actually able to come along um and perhaps that suggests that the people whose society think 
have done everything right and fit and you know sit neatly in our pews aren't actually necessarily the people who are able to join in easily indeed which in my mind links quite well with the reading in job but is there anything else that you particularly want to throw in with the mark reading before we turn to job no i think we've we've done well on mark let's done well on mark okay well let's turn to job 42 then verses 1 to 6 and then 10 to 17 so this is the end of the book of job and very much feels like the first part of this is a response to the reading in 38 we had last week and, and the bit that i guess i thought linked quite well with the gospel reading but feel free to tell me that i'm making this up and it's not there and um, it's just there's something here about job's friends were saying what they thought were the right things and they got it wrong if you like they there's the crowd um in theater terms it'd have been the greek chorus um and yet um well they were wrong um but there's something how through job's suffering he says that he now sees and understands god in a new way and perhaps bartimaeus had that even if he wouldn't have had that language and then i was reading a quote from Oscar Romero, Archbishop Oscar Romero, who, who said, there are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. And it just struck me that both those readings speak to that about how the marginalization and the suffering actually enable people to see God in a way that doesn't get seen otherwise. Absolutely. And I suppose you can look at what happens in this bit of Job in two different ways. Um, because the other way to look at it is that Job has to conform at this point in some ways. Um, you know, he has to say that he was wrong and um, fit in with God's narrative, as it were. Um, and also he has to kind of societally conform by embracing his friends and actually kind of taking them back on side. But on the other hand, there is something very powerful about the fact that through his suffering, he's able to do those things of his own free will. God's not having to force him to to say, actually, you were right, God. And his friends aren't having to kind of pull him back into their way of living and of thinking. He is able now, having gone through that journey of suffering for himself, um, to make that choice, not to be to be forced. I, I think Job's treatment of his friends here is is quite remarkable, really, um, where it, it just even in verse 10 says and joe prayed for his friends um and he says to them that i will um, i will won't deal with you according to your folly i i just the whole thing there just strikes me as being remarkably gracious that joe might pray for them when all all that they've done and and then they eat together and yeah i just which again is such an important um actual thing in terms of talking and listening and relationship building but also the symbol of sharing the table together is is profound as well. So I, I was just really struck by this, all the significance in this. It just felt like it was a very rich passage. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that Job teaches us is to deal with despair, not to just ignore it. Um, I know a lot of people who don't like Job and they're like, can we just not talk about Job because it's so <laughs> difficult? But actually, I think that's kind of the whole point of Job is like God and Job's friends can't just ignore the issues. If the issues are ignored, then Job can't engage with God and can't engage with his friends. Um, so it is actually that deep engagement with suffering that leads to the possibility of grace and hospitality. So actually, if you're going to sit around a table and ignore any of the divisions or difficulties or disagreements, um or differences or inequalities that are at that table um then it's not going to work yeah yeah absolutely. there's i think leaning into the discomfort rather than away from it it's such an important thing and i think we when we first did job a few weeks ago we, we spoke about that a bit as well and i think as a preacher we do our congregations a disservice by not leaning into that i think otherwise people read this and then well, what do i do with that you know because actually i've not no one's really said to me this is hard from the front and i think there's something rather wonderful about a preacher saying this is really hard um or this is challenging um 
and being open about the challenge that it poses rather than I don't have a neat formula for this, so therefore I'm going to ignore it. Absolutely. And I think also it's one of those places where our preaching should link into our practice, mm -hmm. both in terms of pastoral care and in terms of how we deal with conflict and disagreement in the church, that actually just ignoring it isn't peace. Um, in the Iona community, we have a phrase which is we pray for peace, but not easy peace. Okay. And I think that that's the sort of sense that I get from from the conversation we're having about this reading is that actually, if it's easy, it's not really peace. It's not really reconciliation. It's not really hospitality. Um, you have to wade through the mud, as it were, in order to actually get to peace. Um, you know, conflict resolution isn't about just ignoring the difficulty or ignoring the conflict and pretending it's not there. It's actually about having the hard conversations. And Job has a whole book and many, many chapters of hard conversations mm. um, before the reconciliation is actually possible. Yeah, that's true. I think that's one of the challenges of the lectionary is it's only really given us, what, four or five weeks to do the whole of Job. And actually, there's a whole load of stuff and processing and conversation and that happens before we get anywhere near where we are today. And I think um, that speaks to or has the capacity to speak to sometimes the time it takes to get to a place like first chapter 42 it's very hard to jump straight from chapter two to chapter 42 without the wrangling and the wrestling in between. Be nice yeah, if it was, but. Absolutely. And also that a lot of that wrangling and wrestling, it's not academic. Um, yes. It's not clever theories about who God is or about God as creator, or indeed if we were to be completely topsy turvy and flip it into the gospel about salvation, it's not, it's not those academic arguments about why the Bible is right that convince Job, it's nature. It's actually like the wonder of the world around him. And I think sometimes we can get disengaged in theological debates from what's actually going on around us. So I think it's really interesting that Job is kind of this practice of observance in the midst of grief. Um, it's not abstract and that carries on right to this point where it's actually about embracing and eating with friends. Um, there's nothing abstract about the resolution or the hope that Job gets at the end. It's very material. It's very fleshy and real. Um, and I think sometimes we can talk in abstracts and forget that the good news of the gospel is that it's about real people um, embracing each other and sitting around tables. Um, it's not an abstract, well, Jesus fixed this all for us a long time ago. It's something that we have to be doing now. Absolutely. And a, a hat tip at this point to uh, Bishop Paul Bays, who was a guest earlier in the season, who's written an excellent book called The Table, which covers a lot of the things we're talking about this morning and is a, a really helpful read. I, I promise, uh, Bishop Paul, if you're watching, I do have a copy on my shelf. I just have obviously lent it to someone because I can't find it. Otherwise, I'd be waving it like I often <laughs> wave other books that I mentioned. But I, I do have a copy, honest. Um what i had one other thing on, on job i don't know if you there was it ends by saying that the lord blessed the latter part of his life more than the former here and i guess i kind of in my mind went to um where we read elsewhere in the old testament about um god restoring the years that the locusts have eaten mm. um, which i i find such a powerful and encouraging yet sort of sad image there was something in that here um because although job is very blessed at the end might job have preferred not to you know have the suffering in order to get there um i don't know but it, it it ends it ends well for job he died old and full of years it says yeah and i think it's one of the bits that we have to be a bit careful with because sometimes that can be used to kind of preach a gospel of well, we'll end up with lots of stuff. You know, if yes. we carry our cross for long enough, we'll be rich. And it is tempting because it does talk about riches and so on. But there's both the hope, I guess, that Job, through his suffering, does get everything restored to him. And also the mm -hmm. fact that it's not just riches, it's his ability to appreciate what he has and his ability to actually engage with the world in a different way. Um, and so... I guess I like to focus on that over and above the money and of course the fact that a new family 
can't erase the grief that Job has for everything that he's lost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Hebrews, Hebrews 7, verses 23 to 28. Um, I can, I confess to, I, I, I happen to, I'm not sure I'm preaching on this this weekend, but I, I'm not sure I'd be doing that much. Not that it isn't excellent, but I, I see that the Job and the Gospels, I can see lots of interweaving bits. Um, but is there anything that particularly strikes you out of Hebrews this morning? I guess. So right at the beginning, I said that for me, the, the thing that we've through is grace um, over and above conformity. And I suppose for me, the Hebrews makes that leap, but only if we're very, very careful with it, because in the Hebrews, you have this image of perfection in Christ. And the temptation is to try and live up to that. And that's kind of the opposite, I think, of the grace that today's readings offer that actually the point is because of the whole Jesus thing, we are good enough just as we are. To me, that's the only way that I can pull the Hebrews into the other two readings that it's about saying, so actually it's done, you know, we are good enough. Um, Bartimaeus is good enough, Job is good enough, we're good enough. It's not about living up to some sort of holiness code or standard of perfection. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I'm I'm not as much a fan of the Hebrews as the other two readings, to be fair. But yeah, there is something about the totality of Christ's sacrifice here, isn't there? There's just, um, it, as you say, it's done. Um, and and really, I, that's, that's Hebrews in a nutshell, isn't it, really? Um, and, and there's something about the greatness of Jesus, how he bore our griefs, carried our sorrows, but emerges steadfast, resolute, made perfect forever and someone who is faithful we read in it as no one else has ever been faithful yeah but of course the 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 difficulty or the kind of negative challenge in that is that it is sometimes used to hold christians to a certain standard of faithfulness or yeah. to say well if you believe in this atonement theory or that way of understanding the cross then then you're good enough then you're in it's kind of Hebrews is one of those books that I think is sometimes used to suggest that there is a, a right way of believing. Okay. Um, and actually that strikes me as kind of not being what the author is doing. It kind of strikes me that actually Hebrews seems to be saying there's not one right way to be or to believe or to think because actually it's about action. It's about the fact that, that someone is willing to actually give up everything. Um, mm -hmm. So in a way, I guess it would be a good reading to have gone in last week's readings with the rich yeah. young man, actually, that, that is an example of, of giving up. And that includes giving up the sense that we know what is right. Mm. Is there anything else on, on our readings for this week that you'd want to throw into the pot? Um, I think just to say that whenever we're, we're talking about healing, listening to disabled voices, um, is is so so key and is something that that often um we don't have the privilege or take the time uh to do yeah absolutely right well alex thank you so much for coming on to politics in the pulpit and sharing your wisdom and reflection with us today we really appreciate it um and thank you to all of you as well for joining us and we look forward to catching up with you again uh, next time we catch up on politics in the pulpit. Uh, if you want to share with us how you uh, preach from these texts or if there's key things that stand out to you from what we've chatted about today or from the texts themselves, join us on Twitter, Politics in the Pulpit. We'd love to hear how you are preaching these texts uh, this week. But as we head off, we go with our blessing for this season. May the blessing of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son who weeps the tears of the world's suffering be with us. And may the blessing of the spirit of reconciliation and hope be with us from now and into eternity. Amen. Amen.